this is going to be an enormous change of subject. It will still be about Ayn Rand, however. Uh, Ayn Rand's life and work were a feminist manifesto. She wouldn't like me saying that because she was, in the early days of feminism, very opposed to it for reasons that we can go into later if you want. <clears throat> but nevertheless, I think that statement is correct, that her life and work could be taken as a feminist manifesto. <coughs> oh, dear. Excuse me, I'm getting over bronchitis, so if I cough at you, forgive me. I don't have to tell you, I don't believe, that, that her life was a manifestation of feminism at its most exalted. This was a woman, whatever her faults, who never lost for a split second her independence of mind. When she didn't like the philosophical system she found, she created her own because there was no one else to do it. You know that she fought against enormous odds all her life. She was hated by most of her culture, but she went on and she fought and she fought. And even at the end of her life, when she was ill and sad and weary and disappointed, she decided she would write, and she began writing a television script of Atlas Shrugged because she had become convinced that nobody else could do it. Whatever are the most admirable qualities of feminism, and there are many, Ayn Rand exemplified them. Feminists, of course, don't like her, uh, but uh, the, the feminazis don't like her, if I may use that expression. The ones who see the state as the solution to all human ills. They would do well to study her. They would find in We the Living, Kira, a young girl who fought alone against the, the brutal weight of communism, who dreamed of building glass skyscrapers and aluminum bridges, and who all her life, her short life, held on to the independence of her mind despite living in a world that was nothing but the reverse propaganda. She used her mind, she went her way, she made her own decisions, and she loved as passionately as she fought. In Atlas Shrugged, they would see Dagny, a woman of giant intellect who ran a railroad, who also loved deeply and passionately, who made her own life by the decisions of her own mind. I believe very strongly, and there was never any question of this, never any contradiction to this, that women properly were purposeful, independent, active, productive, that they were the intellectual and moral equal to man. But what I want to discuss tonight is an issue that has sometimes been seen as a contradiction to this kind of feminism. It has been troubling to many of her readers and it puzzled me for a long time. And I'm referring to the sex scenes in her books. May I add that though I suspect some of her readers are troubled philosophically, I don't think I've met many who are troubled emotionally. All of the sex scenes and before I came here, I went through her books and checked just to be sure. All of them, it's not only in the famous rape scene in the Fountainhead, have what is often seen as a disturbing amount of violence in them. All of them, whether it's Kira with Leo, whether it's Dominique and, and Rourke, Dagny with Francisco or Galt, they could equally be called rape scenes, equally with Dominique and Rourke in the Fountainhead. That is, the woman is taken violently by the man, often seemingly against her will. She's helpless against the power of his sexuality. That's the common theme that runs through all of these scenes. With one proviso, and again, I checked every single sex scene to make sure this was so, and it is. Uh, Ian once was asked about the rape scene in the Fountainhead, and her answer was wonderful. She said, if it was rape, it was rape by engraved invitation. 
Uh, and that's true of all her scenes. The woman has given permission, not necessarily in words, but at least tacitly. The man knows that he's passionately desired. And let me just read you a short passage uh, that occurs between Dagny and Galt. Quote, he held her with a tense, <clears throat> purposeful insistence, his hand moving over her breasts, as if, he were, as if he were learning a proprietor's intimacy with her body, a shocking intimacy that needed no consent from her, no permission. She saw his smile, the smile that told her she had given him permission long ago. That's the typical theme of all the scenes. In attempting to explain this, I may very well be accused of, psychologize, of psychologizing, but I don't think that's what I'm doing. I did know her for almost 20 years. I was her closest female friend. She talked to me alone about very personal issues. And I spent four and a half years working on her biography. That's a way of coming to know someone that is very difficult to, me to communicate. Imagine how well you know whatever person is closest to you. And you probably know that person extremely well. But imagine taking four and a half years out of your life to do nothing but understand that person fully. That's a kind of knowing that, let me give an example of the kind of knowing it is. Occasionally, I'm quite unlike Ian. Occasionally, I would be trying to figure out what she would do or say in a certain situation, and I would begin introspecting to find the answer. I, one literally has the feeling, writing a biography, that you carry that person around inside you for that period of time and can learn certain things, not by looking outside at, at her, but inside at yourself. And that's often where I found answers that didn't pertain to me, they pertain to her. So I hope what I'll be offering you is informed opinion, not psychologizing. I've been convinced for many years that any writer's sex scenes represent their own personal sexual fantasies, that they're not simply invented out of whole cloth for the purposes of a novel. They come from very deep within the writer's own psychology and from the writer's fantasies of the nature of transcendent sex. You have nowhere to go but inside yourself to find uh, to, to explain through somebody else what, what sex is all about. Okay, how, how do we account for Ian's view of sex, for what is demonstrated in her books? The first issue that I will just mention, because I don't think it was of great significance, of some, you know, I think one of the definitions, though I wouldn't dare try to define genius, but one sort of approximate, almost definition, is that a, a genius is the person who will question as much as is humanly possible about the things other people don't think to question. That is, we're all brought up in, in worlds, small worlds, large worlds, in which we hear certain things said or implied every single day of our lives. We don't make a judgment about them. They're sort of in the air we breathe. And so we go along without doubting them or thinking about them. They seem self-evident. The genius is the person who questions the self-evident, which Ayn Rand certainly did. However, no one in the world can question everything. Everyone carries some emotional baggage from their past, some issues that they think are true simply because they've never thought about them. Um, what I'm talking about specifically in this, in this uh, sense is guilt. 
which in many ways was very alien to Ion psychology. But I suspect, I do not know, that there was some... She, Ayn Rand was born in Russia and brought up in Russia. There would be no way for, that I can think of for a young girl in that very sexually repressive atmosphere, especially a young girl who would have become aware of her own intense sexuality very early, to, not to carry some touch of guilt with her. And the reason I, sus I suspect this is that in her sex scenes, since the woman is taken violently, she bears no guilt. She hasn't initiated it. It's not her sexuality that causes the sex act. It's the man's. Now, as I say, I think this is a small element. The next one is more important. Ayan was, in one sense, rejected by men all her life. It began with Leo, the man she loved in Russia. She once told me that if Leo had asked her to marry him, she would never have left Russia. And she probably would have been killed there. But she would have stayed. She loved him that much. He rejected her. I saw the reason. It, the, the rejections throughout her life were not in the obvious form in which Leo rejected her. But I saw, even when she was in middle age, if, if we were at a party, I would see men th and women throng around her to listen to her. But even among her contemporaries, there was nothing personal. And I saw the men around her scared to death of her. She's just too smart, too, too impressive, too aggressive intellectually. They back up. They're drawn to her, but as men, they back up. I don't, she, I don't know that she was ever consciously aware of it, but she had to have felt it. And I think what that did was make her very, not afraid, but uneasy about initiating with a man. And again, in her sex scenes, she doesn't have to initiate. The man initiates. Another reason that I think they are as they are. In such a sexual encounter, where the man is the, the very active one and the woman submits, the woman can drop her controls. With Ion, it was an issue of dropping iron controls that ruled her life. She could drop the struggle, drop the battles, bat drop the aloneness, and surrender herself to a force that was stronger than she was. I think this was very important psychologically. She felt so much alone in the world, so much that whatever was going to happen in her life she had to make happen. Nothing was coming from the outside. In this sexual context, a great deal was coming from the outside from the man. He was entering her world, and she didn't have to initiate. The most important thing that I think accounts for these scenes, for the quality of them, is that in childhood and all through her life, she was stronger and wiser and more courageous and braver and smarter than anybody else she met. If she met her equal, I never heard about it. Um, it was hard. It was very lonely for her. She suffered a great deal for it. She wanted desperately to find at least an equal what she wanted even more than that was to find someone wiser than she, braver than she, more courageous than she. There was a desperate longing to find that, and she never did. Throughout her life, she never did. She never found an end to her loneliness. 
but she could create him in her novels, and especially in her sex scenes. In the world of her novels, she for once didn't have to be the leader. She could surrender to, to a man and find in herself the softer, warmer woman who existed inside her, but whom she could ne almost never express in ordinary life. She could be without the controls. He decided what they would do. She didn't. For once in her life, she didn't. Ian wrote of Dagny's, and this is a quote, her need to find in a man the courage, the will, and the strength that would bring her helplessly to her knees. Ian would have given anything on earth to find such a man. I only regret that she never did. Thank you. to be very difficult to ask questions when we talk yeah, about right. such different things, but please. I have a question for John and Bra Barbara, if you wish to comment. Why do you, you know, to me, Ayn was like a genius who illuminated recesses of the human soul I would never have imagined as a young person. Like, after I read Atlas Shrugged, I began to understand what might motivate the people in the world who were running the world, like what kind of motivations could they possibly have? I mean, this was an act of genius. Why, why was it so important for her to be considered a philosopher, which, as you well know, is, is difficult for her to be seen that way, in a sense, in the modern world? She didn't want to be without basic premises, and so she forged those for herself, to a large extent from Aristotle, and to a some extent from Thomas Aquinas, uh, but also she invented a great deal. Uh, well, part of her intellectual independence consisted in wanting a sound basic philosophy, which she had to do for herself. You know, whether she did it satisfactorily is a matter of disagreement among people. But uh, she didn't want to do the second, third, fourth, and fifth stories without doing the foundation. If I might add something, it was very upsetting to me that only in her obituaries did I see her called novelist philosopher or philo philosopher novelist, which she would have given a great deal to see in her life and never did. Um, she, I often, uh, you know, <coughs> She wanted to be recognized as a philosopher, and I th certainly she was uh, would have been tops in that league too. But you see, in the philosophical community, you have to engage in discussion. You have to let's say write a f write an article and put it into a philosophical journal, and then somebody replies to it, and then you reply to that, and so on. And she never never entered the arena, that kind of arena. And if you don't choose to enter that kind of arena, you just don't get known in the profession. And that's why, I think a good part of the reason why, uh, she never was recognized as an intellectual. She just was considered uh, a novelist who happened to have things like Galt's speech stuck in there, which they may or may not have liked, but uh, that was incidental to, the, to them. So as a result, she never, she never got the recognition in the philosophical community, but she did see my point when I said, well, the, the way things are these days, to get in that, in that community, you have to enter the arena of philosophical disputation. And she didn't want to do that. And I think it would have helped in the 30s and 40s had she not been a woman. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was very much a strike against her. Who heard of a woman philosopher? Yes, there depends on what on, on 
what she said, but there would be, yeah, there are. They haven't heard the question. I think if she had written an article on the stolen concept or something like that, I mean, the, yeah, that's reputable intellectual stuff. And somebody might have replied and said, I have the following objections, one, two, three, but it would have been there. Yeah, I think it would have. But we, we'll never know. You know. Uh, Walter. Oh, no, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, you were commenting, uh, Barbara, on Ayn Rand's sexuality and her. Uh, you were commenting on Ayn's sexuality and her desire for a man who uh, she could admire and look up to. Uh, leaves sort of a big question: What was exactly her relationship with uh, her husband, Frank O'Connor? Did she not admire or look up to him? That's not an easy question to answer. It's a very complex issue. Yes, in certain ways, she did look up to him and admire him. Frank was one of the finest men I've ever met in my life. He was very much loved by the people around him. I have never heard anybody say a bad word about Frank. Many people didn't understand, however, what their relationship was all about, what they were doing together. He was not an intellectual. Uh, he was not many of the things that, that John Galt was, certainly, or any of her heroes. I have always believed that it was Frank, that person, not, who was not an intellectual, who was not John Galt, that person whom I am truly loved. I also believe she could never quite admit it to herself or anyone else. And over the years, I saw her constantly refer to him as her hero, uh, as, as John Galt, as, as having virtues which he didn't have and didn't need to have. He was just wonderful as he was. Not everyone in the world is required to be an intellectual. To be the sort of man he was is a sufficient achievement, in my opinion and basically, I believe, in her opinion. One of the things she said to me about him, and this was true, in a, in a childhood and womanhood in which she felt very alone and often betrayed, Frank was, stood with her no matter what. She knew that no matter what the world did to her, Frank would be there and he would understand her context and stand with her. That meant a tremendous amount to her. But she had to aggrandize him, as I have to say she did with many of her friends, myself included. Mm -mm. Uh, Nathaniel and I were geniuses. We were to carry on her philosophy and to carry it further. Uh, we were said to be things, and she said it often publicly, that we weren't. I mean, we would, I'll speak for myself, I was just fine. <laughs> but uh, I wasn't many of the things she said about me, and neither was Nathaniel, and it was the same, I think, psychological phenomenon that was at work with Frank. She could not let us be human beings, we had to be something more. And I believe that was born out of a dreadful loneliness. People would often get the wrong impression seeing Ayn and Frank together. They sense his benevolence, his goodness, and so on, and they think, well, Ayn is the one that wears the pants in this relay. Yeah. Not entirely true, not really true at all. She would rely on his judgment, yes. things like this. Uh, well, I'd like to go see the Leningrad Ballet when it comes to town, and so on. But on the other hand, this is, by doing it, you know, Frank would say to her, you are helping to subsidize an evil empire, or words to that effect. And she would rely on his judgment. And much as she might want to go, she, she'd decide, or that he would decide for her, no, we won't go. And she was glad that he had made that decision. Yes, that definitely. True? She always deferred to him. Always wanted to know his opinion or thought 
How will Frank react to this? Will it be okay with him? If it wasn't, she wouldn't do it, with some exceptions. Have, I answered, have we answered you? I wanted to uh, probe and discuss uh, two things. One, my own relationship with Ayn Rand in a few minutes, and uh, before that, the relationship of uh, von Mises, Ludwig von Mises and Ayn Rand. For many years, I was a friend and uh, follower, confidant of Murray Rothbard, and uh, Murray was, uh, his life was certainly affected by Ayn Rand, and he told me many stories about her, and I wanted to check up on one, or at least get a, a different version of it. Uh, before I say that, I, I, I just realized by what you said, John, tonight, how she had some affinity for von Mises, because I, I was always puzzled as to this, because uh, Ayn Rand was an objectivist, if she was anything, and Mises was a subjectivist, if he was anything, especially in economics. But the key is that Mises was an a priorist, and now I see uh, the way you put it, how much Ayn Rand was an a priorist, even taking it to realms where Mises wouldn't. He would only confine it to economics. She sort of applied it to everything. Um, I guess the, the story I wanted to ask about before I get into my personal <laughs> relationship, very minimal that it was, but I, I guess the older I get, uh, the fewer people had any personal relationship with her, so I guess mine might be of interest. But could you tell me about that dinner that Ayn Rand first met Ludwig von Mises? And I can tell you, I was at that dinner and it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard that story. You tell the story. Well, uh, the story I got from Murray was that Mises d dismissed Ayn Rand as an ignorant young girl. Um, oh, does that sound like Mises to you? He was a gentleman. He was, well, he was very gracious. I heard another story about Mises at, at the first meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society when Hayek and, and Friedman and Repke and all these guys were uh, yakking it up and Mises stood up in a huff and said, you're all a bunch of socialists and walked out. So, uh, <laughs> That's a little different than saying you're an ignorant girl. Well, uh, I was the point is he didn't say it. What, what, could you give me your version of? There was, there's no version to give you. Oh, well, the first Your evening, recollection, I mean. Okay. I admired him very much. Uh, it, not, it, not because he was an a priorist, but be, because she felt he was so great an economist that the way she put it, but not to him, was that she could forgive him for not, ha for not having his philosophy straight, in effect. Uh, but she did admire him a lot. And, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. A number of times I was at her apartment when Mr. and Mrs. von Mises were there and Mr. and Mrs. Henry Hazlitt were also there. And uh, you know, it was a very nice relation. There was no, no tensions at all that I could discern. She did say to me once, she said, I admire von Mises as an economist and only that, but she said, I'm not going to try to convert a man in his 80s. I will take him for the good that he has right. to give. That's almost your exact words. Uh, she wasn't quite as generous with Henry Hazlitt because uh, in his book, The Foundations of Morality, he did not give, she thought, sufficient attention to her ethical views and he thought, she thought he should have been more acquainted with them by this time and, 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 and done more. It wasn't enough to break off their relationship, as far as I know, but uh, there, was, there was a bit of tension there over that, that she wasn't going to forgive him because he was 80 years old. He, he wasn't, and so uh, uh, it was a slightly different situation uh, with Hazlitt. She thought he should, he should have, she thought he should have known better. I do remember that have, they're having a very heated argument, but nobody was calling names. And it was about the draft. Von Mises was for the draft, and Ian was passionately against it. So that got rather heated, but I can only say philosophically heated. They weren't throwing things at each other. Okay, does that answer you? Yes, fine. I was going to give my recollections, but 
that was when there were no people behind me. Since there are now, I'll defer to the next, and if there's time, maybe I can get back. Well, well I'm kind of interested, aren't you, John? <laughs> if there yes. Were, if there's okay. Uh, <laughs> once upon a time, long, long ago, uh, this was in 1962 when I was a senior at Brooklyn College, Ayn Rand came to lecture. And it was a gigantic auditorium. There must have been 3,000 kids there, and I was a young pinko, commie, whatever. <laughs> it's hard to believe, but it's true. <laughs> Uh, and I came to boo and hiss her, and I booed and hissed her for an hour and a half, and I didn't get enough booing and hissing. <laughs> and then the president of the Ayn Rand Study Club or something like that, the group at Brooklyn College under whose auspices she had been invited, said that there would be a luncheon in her honor and anyone could come. And I figured, well, anyone includes me, so I came. And they were sitting at this long table in, in sort of a hierarchical status, I guess. Ayn Rand was at the head of the table, Nathaniel was here, and Leonard Peikoff. I don't know if you were there. I don't remember I that. I don't think so. Yeah. And uh, I was sort of relegated to the foot of the table, uh, as befits a person who had no you know, previous knowledge and only a hit, deep abiding hatred for free enterprise and free everything. <laughs> and I was relegated to the foot of the table, and I turned to my neighbor and I said, what is all this uh, capitalist crap? You know, we'll have babies starving in the streets and people <laughs> sleeping on the bridges, you know, the whole bit. And he said, well, you know, I hardly know. I've only been at it for a few months. The people that do know are up there. So I, uh, I stuck my head between Ayn's and Nathan's, and I said, there's a socialist here who wants to debate somebody on these issues. And I said, oh, yeah, who? And I said, oh, it's me. <laughs> And uh, Nathan was, uh, I guess I was a chutzpahnik in those days, but Nathan was very gracious and he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. I'll talk to you if you make two promises to me. One, that you will not let the conversation lapse until one of us convinces the other, or at least until we've done it, until we're fully convinced that no convincing can be done. And secondly, you'll read two books that I recommend. Uh, the two books were um, Atlas Shrugged, and uh, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Uh, those two books I assigned to my freshman classes now. And it <laughs> That's certainly, great. Certainly That's turned wonderful. my life around. Uh, and we continued our discussion. And um, so, so I had one glimpse of Ayn Rand. I, I said this statement uh, in her and Nathan's ear. And I went to Nathan's apartment. Uh, I guess you are in his apartment at the time. <laughs> I don't know that I met you there. And Ayn would come in sort of fleetingly and, you know, uh, ask a question or, you know, become involved in the discussion slightly and then she would leave. And I had seven or eight discussions with Nathan. Mm. And I, I read Atlas Shrugged one weekend without going to sleep much. I mean, I just read the whole thing. I couldn't put it down. It was so magnificent and fantastic. And I probably read it five or six times in the past 30 years, 35 years. Uh, the other um, connection I had with Ayn Rand, if you want to elevate my relationship to her uh, with that word, was um, I don't know where the NBI, that is the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, which was sort of like a, a, a group dedicated to the promulgation and discussion of her philosophy. I don't know where it was. I guess there were meetings at various hotels, and I went to those. In, in no, the, and then it uh, finally got a um, permanent home in the sub-basement of the Empire right. State Building. That was after a year or we so. We called it the lower level. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. The lower level, and there was discussion of, you know, moving on up to the, to the highest <coughs> levels. And I went to uh, several of those, and I was introduced to her, or I reintroduced myself. I don't really think she knew of me, or, but I had met her, so it was, I guess, legitimate for me to presume to say hello, and mm. she was very gracious to me. Uh, I don't know, I, I guess I soon after that slipped away from uh, the objectivism and got into libertarianism. But that, those are my recollections. That's very interesting, thank you. <clears throat> the reason I was very comfortable with Walter to carry on was that when I got up there was no one here and I thought, <laughs> well, I'm not going to miss such an opportunity. Um, and then various things came into mind, one of which is that I was just going to ask you to carry on talking. Um, but while I am here, my own recollections of Rand are somewhat strange, that is I never met her, I lived on the opposite side of the earth and I got to libertarianism through her works and particularly through what was my closest friend who introduced me to the ideas. Um, 
uh, but my only contact with her was that she excommunicated me from, ah, okay. uh, from the movement uh, because I quoted her somewhere and uh, I, had, uh, I was written a lawyer's letter saying that um, I'd done this without consent and I was therefore excommunicated or words to that effect. And then Leonard Pickoff, not knowing that I had already been excommunicated, re-excommunicated me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so I like have the, you know, the, whatever it is, the, the curse or the blessing of two excommunications. Um, and he did it because I had a debate with his representative in South Africa about some very trivial aspect of her works. With his representative? Uh, yes, his representative, yeah, yeah. And she, uh, well, there was a little amusing angle to that. She wrote off to him saying, uh, Leon Lowe has sinned and must therefore be excommunicated, and he wrote back uh, giving his blessing to that. Uh, but unfortunately, his secretary put the letter to her in the wrong envelope, and it came to me. Oh, wonderful. So I opened this letter to her, uh, approving of my excommunication. Uh, and I thought it was an interesting sort of angle to justice, you know, no one asked you know, for another side of the story or whatever. And it was a very trivial issue. Um, so that's what little contact I've had was uh, two excommunications, which <laughs> I suppose is quite an achievement uh, when you've never had contact with any of the people who excommunicated you. Check Anyhow. with Tibor McCann. <laughs> he had the same experience of being excommunicated twice, oh. once by yeah. Ian and once by, by Leonard. He, he drove all the way from Los Angeles to Colorado uh, being told that they could have, he and Leonard could have some conversations about philosophy, and after traveling those 1,500 or 2,000 miles, when he got to Leonard's door, he, word had got out, no, can't talk with you, go back home. <laughs> anyway, the, yeah. w what I did want to ask, by the way, that didn't uh, have any negative effects, I don't think, on my Good. views towards uh, her or Leonard or the ideas. Um, but uh, what I did want to ask is that I have the odd uh, experience that my whole introduction to von Mises and libertarianism was directly through Rand. It was like a very rapid conduit. Um, and yet objectivists, uh, most of them I believe to this day, and uh, Rand herself uh, were so uh, intensively hostile to libertarians, right-wing hippies and so on and so forth. And I've never really had an opportunity, I've spent lots of time with, uh, with John, not with you, to kind of get to the bottom of this, and my question is, I suppose, somewhat of a, two naive questions, and I apologize for that. Um, one is, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it seems to me that all libertarianism says is uh, there, there shall be mutually volitional interaction between consenting adults. Um, which, as I understand it, she says. Uh, and it seems to me to have this wrath and venom for libertarians is like somebody who says, I'm an atheist, uh, and then because the atheist doesn't buy all the rest or doesn't even know about all the rest, then to denounce atheists uh, because they aren't fully-fledged objectivists um, or any other single tenet that, that, that objectivists would go with. So, Really, just to get an opportunity to ask two luminaries like mm -hmm. you to respond to what seems to me to be anything but an objective mm -hmm. response yes. uh, to, to libertarianism. Increasingly with age, I think, she would have the following characteristic. There could be a dozen things in favor of somebody or some position, but if there was one against it, that would, that would do it for her, for instance. She didn't want anything to do with Ronald Reagan because of the, his stand on abortion. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with economic, however much she might have approved some of the things he said and st stood for because she defended Goldwater. You know, it was simply on the basis of this. And there were many instances of that kind. I think it was not libertarianism she objected to, but libertarians. Yes, I mean, yeah. uh, there, there, there were a lot of them. You know, Wild-eyed, cocky, confident, uh, long hair, so the, all the, the hippie sort of stuff that she never liked to begin with, and there was a lot of that, especially in the in, in the early movement, and it really, really turned her off. Uh, but certainly the philosophy, I mean, 
I became a libertarian because of her. Yeah, uh, it was, it, you know, I saw no fundamental disagreement. In fact, some things she, uh, she said, like in, in all exchanges and in all interactions and enterprises involving two or more persons, the voluntary consent of all parties is required. Well, this would seem to undercut all government. I mean, this is a different subject I don't want to go into now, but there, uh, certainly she was really libertarian through and through, but there was something, something, I think it was the people involved more than anything else. Maybe uh, she thought they were trying to compete, although God knows they gave her enough credit. They referred to her all the time. Uh, as, as the as the, the fountainhead of their ideas, as is being done here. As is being done here. May I add something, John? It it was more the hippie part was certainly part of her objection. But let me say, she never would have written the article that came from Leonard's people. Never. Uh, and that article, I think, was preposterous, and I believe she would have thought so too. What she objected to was the Libertarian Party. There was no movement. There was simply the party. And her powers of prediction were quite remarkable, astonishing, as a matter of fact. She said it was the anarchist wing, the Murray Rothbard wing of the party, which she, which she objected to. <coughs> she also felt that the party, because of that, had no philosophical base, and that it wasn't enough I, I said this in another context, I think, but she said that if economics could have won the battle for capitalism, economics alone, it would have been won long ago because the economic proofs are there. Her point was that only by, by, by moral persuasion can you win the case for free enterprise. Uh, and she felt the libertarians, per se, are not presenting a moral case and will not they also have tremendous dissension with their, within their own ranks because of this. She predicted that the day would come when the anarchist wing would split the party in two, which it did. Just two small points before I walk away and defer to my immediate superior. The, uh, one is that the, uh, in South Africa, just as an anecdotal piece of information, John knows because he's visited there a few times, her books are more visible and prevalent in bookshops than anywhere else I've seen in the world. Wonderful. Uh, it's something that's always intrigued me because they all seem to be invisible. And we don't know who buys them, but there's an enormous demand for her literature. Oh, I'm glad. And in, every, in the average bookstore, you will find three or four of her titles. And they sell in large volumes to people who, as far as we can tell, sort of go off and do their own yeah. uh, thing somewhere. The hmm. second one, John, I just wanted to make the observation that my question was somewhat different from the Reagan uh, analogy because there she was concerned about an issue on which she disagreed with Reagan. As far as I can tell, there's nothing about libertarianism with which she disagrees except perhaps, as you say, the anarchist wing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's very relevant that I met Ayn in the 50s. I never knew of her during the 50s to excommunicate anybody. By the way, we, she and we never called it excommunication. It was, but we didn't call it that. Um, but it was as she grew older, as many disappointing things happened to her, she became more bitter. And then I saw the excommunications begin, but not until then. Leonard doesn't have that justification. And, I mean, he has... He has, about a year ago, excommunicated the last person from the old days who was in his life. There's nobody left. Uh, when my book came out, there was wholesale excommunication, which I must say pleased me. Because if you, read, if you read my book, you were in bad trouble. If you liked it, you were out, gone. Uh, I don't know if you know that his review of my book said that he had never read it and, just, and didn't intend to, but he knew from friends who had read it for him <laughs> that it was evil, that the world knew I was immoral, that it was full of lies, and no objectivist should read it. Sounds uh, very objective. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> very. If I, can, if I can just start on a, with a brief comment on the libertarian thing. 
it would seem to me that there, there, there was a, one very radical difference, which was that, as we've heard debated at this conference, libertarians will say that apart from the consent axiom, there's nothing else to libertarianism, and that it has no morality. And no, no, Ayn no. was deeply moral. I mean, I think most libertarians have, have, their, have a strong sense of morality, and that in fact within that consent axiom there's a deep morality. But li many libertarians deny that. They say, no, this isn't about morality, this is simply about that all relationships will be consenting and everything else will be irrelevant. That in itself, I would have thought, would be sufficient to drive her crazy. Yes, it would. That's what she meant by no philosophical base. As a matter of fact, Walter Block and I were arguing about that. It's, it's all very well to take as your axiom the uh, non-aggression, but, but it isn't in fact an axiom. And what do you say if someone says, well, that's not my axiom? You ca can't say anything. Sure. It, it has to be justified, and it can only be justified morally. Depends how one defines libertarianism, doesn't it? I mean, sure. does libertarianism include as an essential part of itself a doctrine of human rights? I would be inclined to say yes, and in that case that is a, that is a moral tenet. But of course, in the opinion of many it doesn't, you see. Uh, 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 von Mises was a utilitarian, and as far as I know, didn't, didn't say anything about it about the concept of human rights. But I imagine it, it was that those libertarians who emphasized that kind of contextlessness of it that would have been particularly yes. repulsive to her. You're exactly right. Yes. yes it was. Okay, yes. The, the other thing I just wanted to ask you about, Barbara, is you talked about her, her aggrandizement of her friends and the people she was close to and I was going to say, didn't she also do that with herself? In other words, invest in herself um, qualities of perfection and require that of herself to be a heroine. Yes, she did indeed. Instead yes. of allowing herself to be a human being and to have weaknesses and faults, which is really so much easier to live with yourself if you can accept that. Yes, she did. And uh, I just wondered, in, in doing that, whether the, the, the cause of that, of her refusal to see normal, fallible characteristics in herself and the people she was close to, doesn't lie rather in her early life, in her childhood, in other things that happened there that gave her the, the loss of self-esteem. because. In, it's very hard. What you're saying is quite true about her attitude toward herself. It's very difficult for me to see an eye on lack of self-esteem. Uh, I know that one could think, well, it follows from that. But in, in her case, and I'd have to say generally, I'm not at all sure that's true. Uh, she was trapped, in a way, by her own ideas. Because if, she sort of wavered, if one could be and should be a John Galt, then for sure that included her. And there would be no possible justification intellectually for her not being a John Galt. And so she had to be, in the same way that her husband had to be something that he wasn't, and her friends too. Uh, it, but it was in the context of her own philosophy that she was stuck in that trap. She would very often say she made a mistake about something, but she used an odd phrase sometimes, which for the life of me I never understood. She would talk about something being the fault of a virtue, meaning, I think meaning, if she would get very angry at, at someone who asked a question after, after a lecture, which she often did, extremely angry, crushing to the person who asked the question. Afterwards, Nathan and I would, would discuss it with her, and we made it clear that we didn't think she should do that. And she would say, yes, she, know, she knows she didn't. But then she would say, well, it comes from moral indignation, and moral indignation is what one should feel when faced with that. There always seemed to be an explanation that in the end, made it okay. But, it but, in, 
But isn't that then the source of her loneliness? The fact that if you, if you require of yourself to be perfect in all things, and of those around you, and there's a, a deep denial of reality, then you're going to be supremely lonely because being a genius alone isn't sufficient reason. I think geniuses can learn to live with other people and have some loneliness in genius, but nonetheless have healthy, comfortable relationships. You know, they don't for the most part. If you look at uh, historically, this, this pattern of self-aggrandizement and excommunicating people around them who, who differ with them is a very common one among geniuses. Freud was exactly the same way. Uh, many of them have been. I can't say I know quite why, but I think that was one of the sources of her loneliness, but only one. It was, it is very hard to present a, a new philosophical system which goes totally against the culture, to know that she's hated for it, to f do you know, the real loneliness started after Atlas Shrugged, after it was published. What she wanted most was one thing, which was to find a peer, someone who in his or her field, his preferably, had achieved something of, of great importance in the world, and who would stand up publicly and announce what kind of achievement Atlas Shrugged was. She thought there would be a few. She never expected many. There wasn't one. And she began to feel, who am I writing for? She had, I mean, fans everywhere, letters, up, letters of appreciation up to the ceiling. But no one known figure who had achieved something important, who stood up publicly to no say what she No one she felt was her equal. Yes. Because and she felt her fans were, were not in any way her equal. Which they weren't, of course. They certainly weren't in, in knowledge and understanding and, and in prominence. And she got nothing, she felt in that sense she got nothing back from the world. That began a lot of a bitterness which just escalated over the years. Thanks. Hi, f forgive me for making this kind of small point because it's a very enjoyable discussion, but I wonder whether it doesn't trivialize her accomplishments by wishing her this um, Harlequin romance wish that she had met this wonderful man, this intellectual giant who would have um, fulfilled her, to whom she could have looked up to, uh, as if her life was unfulfilling and not complete without this. I, I don't ever remember anyone saying that about Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or any other writer. If, if he only had met this wonderful intellectual woman who um, somehow their lives would have been more complete. I really think you minimize it by calling it har Harlequin Romances. For a woman who had the concept of a John Galt, never to meet such a person in her life is very sad. And I'm not assuming that she felt that way. She said so, very often, that that was what she was looking for. That, uh, that wasn't by any means the only thing she was looking for, but uh, the absence of that was bitterly disappointing to her. Well, I understand that it was more, I guess, your comment on it, because I think we're all culture-bound to some extent, and we're at a different time and perhaps looking at things differently. Just. Did you ever discuss with her or hear her comment as to why she did not include Eddie Willers in Atlantis? Do you, do you want to? No. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I wanted him included. And when I came to that section, I felt terrible. And we, and we did discuss why he wasn't included. It's the same reason in a way that, that Kira had to die in We the Living. Because the point of the book was that communism destroys the best among human beings. That it's, it's the best that go first. If Kira had lived happily ever after, she would have destroyed the point she was making. 
Similarly with Eddie Willers, she wanted to show that that sort of man with all his virtues and all his intelligence, even he could not survive in a world without the great achievers, the, the geniuses, that, that, uh, without, without her finding anything wrong with any Eddie Willers, which she didn't. It was that on his level of achievement, he too, not just the, the, what she called the looters, but he too needed the men of greatness to survive. Thank you. I wanted to start, but maybe I won't. No. I wanted to start by uh, saying how grateful I personally am that you both could be here uh, for this conference and for tonight. I've never met either of you. I never got a personal impression of you, and it's, it's, it's wonderful uh, to, to see people only whom I read about or whose books I've read uh, up close. Uh, I, I, I don't have anything uh, against seeing my heroes up close. <laughs> Thank you. And um, oddly enough, that's the theme of uh, I actually wanted to ask you, Barbara, about something that you wrote rather than uh, particularly Ayn Rand, although I strongly uh, imagine that she agreed with this. Um, I guess it was in the early 70s when it came out. You wrote a review of the, uh, the musical and movie 1776, which you titled Prospecting for Clay. Do you remember that? I don't think I wrote that one. Maybe it was Ayn Rand? It, it, I didn't write it. Oh, darn, that ruins my whole question. <laughs> well, I'll ask my other question then. I have um, just recently from the, uh, from the estate of, uh, of a very libertarian friend who recently passed away, acquired the complete set of the records of the basic principles of objectivism lectures and your principles of efficient thinking lectures. And I just wondered, uh, you know, reflecting back over the time since it's been since you did them, what, 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 uh, do, what would you, how do you feel about them now? What do you have to say? Uh, can about the the whole, all the courses or mine? In particular? Well, yours in particular, but Nathaniel's too, because I'm sure you were involved in it, weren't you? Oh yes, indeed. Uh, I think there was a lot of very good and very important material there. I think there was ob there was also much too much reliance on the word of Ayn Rand, much, uh, I'm not saying it exactly as I mean to. Uh, there was a, an insistence built into those lectures that one be an objectivist and that the rest of the world wasn't very admir admirable, which I painfully regret. Uh, I would love one day to review those, to redo my own lectures uh, and to do them properly uh, with the respect due an intelligent audience, which I don't think I gave properly in that time. One quick comment. <clears throat> While you are going over those lectures, do not forget the 10 lectures on free enterprise economics by Alan Greenspan, yeah. also done for NBI. Wonderful stuff. Yes. As clear, lucid, simply presented as anything in von Mises or anywhere else, and done in, in beautifully, beautifully. I cannot believe that he disbelieves that now. No. <laughs> thank, thank you both very much. Just a couple of quick comments, uh, and then I wish to make a statement. Uh, I once asked Nathaniel about Eddie Willers, and his reply was, but don't you see, Bruce, he is, a product, he is the victim of the system. Mm -hmm. That's exactly how he answered it, which I accepted. I thought it was very good. Yeah. I didn't think I would be able to one-up Leon Lowe at any time, <laughs> but I have been excommunicated three times. <laughs> how? <laughs> But I won't go into that right now because there's something else that's more positive okay. that I'd like to talk about. Uh, I was the head of English for some time in a large high school of about 2,000 students. And I exercised my option as the head of the department to choose one novel. 
I let my other teachers choose whatever they wanted. I said, I'm teaching grade 12, which would be the senior year in high school for Americans. This was grade 13 in, in Ontario. And I suggested Atlas Shrugged. No, they wouldn't buy that. So I said, okay, then we'll have the Fountainhead. They didn't want that either. They knew about these books. I said, well, I am going to insist that we have the Fountainhead. And they rebelled and I said, surely I've given you carte blanche on everything from grades nine to 12, including the poetry, the plays and everything. So I am going to exercise my authority as the head of the department and put on the Fountainhead. And uh, then I discovered there was a conspiracy among all the English teachers of Toronto to have the book banned. And I made banned. my fatal error. Oh, they claimed that they were very, it was a very poorly and badly written novel. But the real reason was they didn't like the philosophy, of course. I wasn't blind right. to that. However, I made a fatal error because I could have had every high school student in Ontario reading the book. I suddenly shut up and they said, Evoy talks a lot and now he's shutting up. There's something going on. What is it? So they quietly let the thing drop and I didn't get to give it to the papers that the book mm. had been banned by the English uh, teachers and I didn't get the chance to have every student in Ontario reading yes. Fountainhead. This is one of the great regrets of my life that only once I shut up and didn't <laughs> talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I wanted to explore the uh, relationship of um, libertarianism, uh, anarchism, Ayn Rand, uh, uh, Ayn Rand's attitude toward libertarians uh, and other such issues. Uh, one, one interesting thing is that John Hospice ran for president on the Libertarian Party ticket in, I think it was 72? Yes. And Ayn Rand did not see fit to endorse you even though you were a lot closer to her than Reagan or Goldwater or anyone else. I had been excommunicated before that. Ah, ah. okay. Uh, it was going around a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I guess that was one of the reasons I left after uh, I got to the basement of, or, or the well, ground it, floor. It, it occurred, I, I discussed all this, I, uh, I had a two-part article in Liberty in 1990, which I suppose some of you have read, entitled Conversations with Ayn Rand, so I almost purposely didn't include this evening the things that were included in that long article. Uh, but uh, at any rate, to make a long story very short, uh, I was on the committee of the American Society for Aesthetics to uh, uh, get some speakers and so I suggested her and she said, okay, uh, you would know my work better than anyone else, will you be the critic? I mean, er everyone had to have a critic. So I said, okay, but a critic, of course, can't just stand up and say the talk was wonderful and then sit down again. So <laughs> I, I, I thought of some critical remarks, I mean, I didn't think I overdid it, but at any rate, she really took it amiss and took it as a personal insult, and that, that was it. That, that was the end of it. No more. Yeah. Well, I, I guess one of the things that was perturbing to me in my experience at NBI is the uh, vicious response to people questioning. You know, it wasn't usually hostile questions, but many just not understanding, and she would be very, very uh, You're putting harsh. it really too strongly. It, it, uh, that was the exception. But it was that sort of response. Oh yes, that was the yeah. exception. It wasn't only that way, but every, pretty much every session or every other session, there'd be one. And it Do you was, know, uh, I don't mean to whitewash her, uh, because I think it was a serious mistake. And one of the things it did was stop students from asking questions. Yes. They, they, they were just, afraid to, and with, I don't blame them. The only questions they would ask would be very softball questions. Yes. Uh, there would never uh, be anything uh, uh, that would challenge her yeah, because they were afraid. It was a chilling uh, kind of an effect. I, I'd like to tell you what is a part of my explanation, not the whole. I think I discussed this with you the other night, so, but let me say it again. I am aware of certain issues uh, in my own psychology, for, for instance, I should not have a conversation about the draft with anybody because I can't stay calm. 
I can't talk in a civilized way, I start to yell instantly. And the reason I can't stay calm is that when somebody says the draft, I see butchered young bodies on a field. <laughs> but I, I feel like I'm literally seeing it. And my sense of the other person is, look, that's what you're talking about. That's what you're advocating. They don't see it that way, and, and some part of me knows it. But it's so clear to me, it's so self-evident, that I just lose my patience, my everything, instantly. I think that happened to Ayan, especially as she got older, in a great many ways. In, in the early days that I knew her, she would understand that since her philosophical ideas were in many ways new to her readers, they wouldn't, I mean, she couldn't both say she, she was presenting a moral system which was brand new and expect people to already know it and not to ask questions that would, would, would imply they didn't already know it. Uh, but in, in some areas, she would see the consequences of some error, like I see the butchered bodies. It would be so self-evident to her, so obvious, that she simply couldn't put up with other people not seeing it. She forgot that it wasn't self-evident, that it did require <coughs> explanation. And that's why sometimes she would regret later that she'd become angry, and would know that the person really had, didn't understand, and in effect had a right not to understand. But I think this was part of why she did grow angry. <laughs>